Tyson, for those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. I'm Tyson Clark. I am a sort of hodgepodge of different sort of different professional services in pharmacy for the last 10 years now. I would really like to see pharmacists be able to speak up more and to be more competent in their, in their leadership skills, in presenting offers to patients and in their personal lives too, just being able to assert themselves. I grew up, it was modeled for me. We were always between these two mountains of either silence, you could say agreeableness, mm-hmm. or aggressiveness. And whenever anybody said be assertive, I always put that into the aggressive camp. But there's a beautiful place in the middle there. It can be a kind, polite, but assertiveness. Yeah, like that's the that's where psychology is put it between aggression and passiveness. And uh, man, you, you hit the nail on the head. A lot of people do conflate assertiveness with aggressiveness, including my original clients in this endeavor. But It really is like after you're practicing it and you get over the sort of the fear and we'll get into that a little bit, but after you get over that, you really, it really enriches relationships, enriches all of your relationships. If you think about the 10 top relationships in your life, you're giving something to those relationships, whether it be your staff or your spouse or your kids or your your parents or your in-laws, you give something to those relationships and they, believe it or not, they actually like you. And they would like to know more about you and they appreciate learning new things about you. And there are things that you're hiding from them through politeness, right? Because you don't know how to articulate those things. Yep. You're right, man. It's spot on. There's a lot of fear and people just, I think a lot of the time pharmacists don't ask their spouses though. Their spouses will say, no, what are you talking about? She's not passive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So we sort of, when we don't want to speak up and we're, if we have some fear of the, there being a, some sort of offense in those relationships, we sort of collapse into silence or accepting a circumstance that we don't want to accept because we don't know how to articulate without sacrificing or damaging the relationships. I did that. I had a situation that I did that for so long that I actually thought of myself as almost a liar. You know, that person did not know me because I was not bringing up certain situations. And It went from being maybe not trying to rock the boat to I wasn't even myself. I was almost like a split personality. Right. And you probably resent them for that. You you probably like blame it on them and they might not even know it. (laughs) Well, I blamed it on them. Then ultimately it's like, well, I got to I got to do my part in letting people know who I am. So there's a couple of intelligences that go into assertiveness and psychologists, they call them since I started developing the assertiveness training, I found that psychologists grouped them into what you just did, passive and aggressive. And then assertive is the overlap. And passive is seen as very bad and or overly peaceful. Aggression is seen as very, just very bad. But I like to look at them both as two separate intelligences mm-hmm. that we are trying to sort of meld together. The passive side is this sort of this compliant tribal, like the unwritten rules around culture. And the reason that I think that I've got a little bit of a different take on I started in the sense psychologists do is because I've traveled a little bit and I've seen, you know, I've got friends, my, my best mate in Australia, he's Filipino. Basically all, you know, most Filipinos that you're going to meet, if they were passive in the Philippines, they're not going to be passive in England, let's say in the UK, they're going to come off as very aggressive because they say exactly what they think and there's no offense meant by it. Okay. And I love that. I really enjoy it's very refreshing to hear around Filipino culture and the way that they speak to each other. Just don't refuse food from them because it will be really offensive. <laughs> yeah. That's offensive. But talking about what your body looks like, if you've blown up 15 pounds, that's totally on the yeah. table. But don't refuse pig's feet. So, but yeah, our community is a, and culture is a very big part of that intelligence, right? So what's aggressive on the Upper West Side is not the same as what's aggressive in the Bronx, what's uh, aggressive in Australia is not the same as aggressive in the U.S. So yeah. there's definitely a cultural component here. And it's we've got a cultural component in every part of our life. You don't talk to your best mates the same way you talk to your mom. You don't talk to your spouse with the same sort of unwritten rule set that you talk to you, your workmates. You've got that side and that's the unwritten tribal rules. And you're part of a hundred tribes, right? Sure, right? Sure. Then the other side is the aggression. 
And that's, I've, I think a lot of some psychologists mm-hmm. call this the authentic self. It's just sort of difficult for me to call it that because you can't separate the two. There's no separating mm-hmm. you from other people. You're always part of a tribe. So it's just, it's the, it's that, it's the creed. It's the desire. It's the, it's the passion. It's your values. It's the, I want, give me part of you, right? That it actually, you can't vilify it because it's what drags you out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. If you're self-interested in some respect, you wouldn't do anything. You'd sit on your bum. And so I view these two intelligences as something that we want to kind of have, right? So you want to have your self-expression, the the passion, the greed, the I want, gimme. And then you have to have that within the unwritten okay. rule set of the tribe, whatever tribe it happened to be in, like whether it's work or you're talking to your mother or whatever. So yeah, that's... Perfectly stated, right? I come a little different skew on it in that I call it tribal passion intelligences. It seems to me that when I read some of this stuff about tribes for different reasons, why do people gossip and the assertiveness and that kind of stuff? A lot of that is evolutionary. I mean, if you were in a tribe at night around a tribal fire and you were kicked out of the tribe. You had to go not only 10 feet from the fire, but you had to be 300 feet from the fire. That's not as safe. You're out there with the lions and tigers. Oh, well, have you heard of the studies by Matthew Lieberman on this? Not specifically his name, no. This is a fantastic study. It's quoted all over the world in psychology these days. It re- relates a lot to a timeout. We stopped spanking kids, or it became unpopular to spank kids, mm-hmm. give them a timeout instead. Well, the brain doesn't know any difference. Mm-hmm. So exclusion light blights up the same parts of your brain as physical pain. It mm-hmm. doesn't know the difference. So it's not the light, not just the lions and tigers that you've got to worry about outside of the security of the tribal fire. You're, we, you're right. We have evolved. We're a social animal. And I don't think any of our social signals are there for no reason. You know, there's a reason that fish don't cry. They're not a very communal animal. It gets us help, right? Sometimes we need it. When a kid looks back at you, they're like walking into a new, a new kid, like a little two-year-old, right? Yeah. And they're, ex- they're exploring a new thing. And they'll look back and they can immediately gauge the amount of anxiety on the parent's mm. face as to whether this is a safe thing or not. So, yeah, absolutely. A lot of social signals, a lot of social behavior is for fitting in with that, fitting in with that group. And today, more than ever, I have this maxim when so- social media goes up, social skills go down. And we're wandering in and out of different tribes with different tribal rule sets all the time online because there's no like barrier. So you can wander into, let's for example, using politics, the easy one, wrong, wander into a right wing group and say the wrong thing and get pummeled. And we wander into a left wing group and say the wrong thing and get pummeled. So we don't know what we're walking into. And there's more anxiety about communication. Sure. Because when we're going to get kicked out, is the tribe going to pummel me, send me away from the security of fire, all that sort of stuff? I think that today, when there's everyone's sort of walking on eggshells around each other. And I also think it, that contributes to our anxiety because there is a, especially professionally, right? What you can and cannot say. But if we can't have, if we can't have a logical, well thought out discussion that's, that somebody else doesn't disagree with, then that's probably not a healthy relationship for you anyway. So maybe we should have some more thought behind what it is that we're saying. But I think that Talking to other people about it helps you to extrapolate, grab up each other and sharpen the blade of, of conversation as well. So, yeah, yeah, I'd really like to encourage and give people the tools to do that. It used to be in politics. I've heard it said that when you're walking down the street, you are both left and right. And what I mean by that is. If a left person or a right person politically walk down the street, they're basically going to help somebody the same who's fallen out of a car or something. They're going to try to treat them and help them. Also, maybe take them to something more established like a hospital, all that kind of stuff. And politics, it used to be the fighting was during nine to five. The left, very importantly, had to talk about things way left, about needed change. And the right was there to 
put some brakes on the far left and say, hey, let's not do things too wacky. We've got a world to run here, things like that. But then at night you'd come back and, you know, you'd be with your family and with your neighborhood and people had thoughts all across the board. And you realize that far left and far right talk was important, but it was important for a certain part of the day and then come back to real life. I think the problem with social is that you just get these camps and then the real world doesn't seem to happen. Nobody knows how the hell to live with each other anymore. So, so you're saying you think that the accessibility to the conversation is a big contributor? I think it's too much. I don't yeah. think people are forced back into the real world enough. They can hang with those camps 24-7. And of course, Zuckerberg and these guys, they know that out of 10 posts you read, you want to read nine about people that really agree with you. And then one is from some guy who everybody's disagreeing with, but you have to have that person in there for the other nine to give you something to gripe about. Yeah, I think the griping thing is a big deal, especially today. Like we, we've never had any of this. No. The, the world is, am is amazing. And so I'm from a final queen plant where it's really, it's tropical paradise, right? Yeah. And I have this saying, there's no urgency of paradise. You can't get anyone to buy anything because if they get off the couch, and out of the air conditioner, they just start sweating. So if you can't create some urgency to look at something, I don't know, something that disgusts you, that's the thing I'm going to show you to get you to respond. Yeah. I can't, agreeability is like making it nice and comfortable, but the part that really greets against your values, they're going to amp up and get caught in that. And I don't think it's very particularly good for discussion. I think this is, is like talking yeah. to each other, but we, as that stuff goes up, as social media goes up, your anxiety of dealing with real people is also going to go up and your social skills are going to go down. And, right. and we're, we're absolutely petrified of professionally to say what we want. I mean, like, I'm not politics aside. Yeah. I would just like to see people get along. I think being more assertive could do that where you can say, look, I respect your opinion. I respectfully disagree. This is why we could talk about it. That's fine. I would like to see more of that, but I even in pharmacy, in, in families, right? Like maybe the in-laws overstep their boundaries a little yeah. bit parenting your kids or in a leadership situation at work where, you know, somebody's not pulling their way and you've got to rec help them to recognize that it's not who they are, but their behavior yeah. and that it's having those conversations and not being afraid of it at all. And it's really possible. It's really possible. Tyson, in your business history, part of it was the training app on the phone and the training in terms of if somebody has a twisted ankle, your app would help them say, maybe you should get some ibuprofen and maybe an ankle brace and maybe a cane for the future and so on. But you were finding that when you were babysitting that pharmacy, these things were happening. But as soon as you maybe took off, some of this stuff wasn't happening. And it came down to not being too complicated, but to sometimes just the staff not saying this was important. And some of that comes down to bosses, owners not being assertive enough. And it seems when they're not assertive enough that something else feels better, maybe being peaceful in the moment, but it hurts the long term. So with your new focus or increased focus on assertiveness, why would a pharmacy boss who has all the money invested can make all the decisions they want to, why do they feel that they can't be assertive with their staff in telling them everything? We owners, do we have our fears, even with high schoolers and part-time workers that for some reason we don't feel we can be assertive? Life is very colorful. You've got lots of different things going on. And a pharmacist might feel extremely competent in, um, in working with patients and stuff. But then in deciding this is the direction I want to go in my business, and then the staff don't, don't really go along with it, and they don't do the training, or they th that stuff is hard. You might not be a very confident leader, or you might just be brand new. You might have just graduated, and you're coming into business. I think it is even the people that you think are really confident they're going to have the same problem. And the staff are going to think the same thing. You're really confident. You're wearing a white coat. 
you've got this all this authority, you must know what you're doing at every situation. Well, no, you're just a person. You've got insecurities like anybody else. You don't know if this is the right direction or not. But I think what helps you to to go in a direction that you do want to go is knowing that you can handle situations where the staff don't comply the way that you want them to. You've got to be a lot more confident where you're going to, hey, Jenny, look, I noticed you haven't done the treaty. We remove all the status from the situation. We just talk as people and I can hold you accountable. This is what I want to see. Will you do that for me? It's a really simple conversation, but it, that fear of losing relationships from whatever, right? Probably pharmacists are very compliant types. Yeah. You know, pharmacists are fantastic at holding staff accountable to whoever makes the rules yeah. that aren't them. If it's the FDA or the CDC or whoever, we're going to we're going to do these rules. And if you don't follow these rules, you're done. Because their own goals, their own needs, you know, their own, you know, that I want give me, that give me part of themselves, um, the greed part of themselves. That's 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 not that's not acceptable. Or it's uh, it's less. Uh, it's you're making an apology for it and holding people accountable to what you want as an individual is much more difficult than holding. Mm-hmm people accountable to a role that somebody else makes. If that were the case, I wouldn't have a job, right? And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have had the same conversation with leaders all over the world about the leadership skills and business skills of pharmacists that let it work out to be the same thing. Hey, we need pharmacists to stand up for themselves a little bit more. We need them to speak up more. It's a lot easier for me to let someone go in the business if the outside pressures are there as far as our profits down or this or that, something that's external. When it's internal, when it's your own choice to let somebody go, that's tougher because it reflects back on you, or at least you think it reflects back on you about who you are as a person. You're selfish. You have no feelings, all those kinds of stuff. It's hard when you can't blame it on somebody else. So the governing bodies are really useful. Uh, scapegoats, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it's going to come down to sort of self-image, like you're talking about there. Like, am yeah. I a good person or not? I usually do a self-justification for that, where I'm just like, well, you know, if I don't do this, you know, if I don't hire, fire this person who's not following the rules, then you are going to get another rotten apple that's going to spill a bunch. I even take that in, in in my family, right? Where if there's things going on within your family and you don't call it out, then that sort of behavior that's is going to fester within your family. Yeah. Look, what if there was no anxiety to handling those problems? That's a good question to, to go with. What if there was no, no fear of having the best team or the best fame. What if there is no repercussion to that? And that's actually possible, right? If your mother in law is overstepping your boundaries or if there's staff that are running amok a little bit or if things are sort of slipping away from you, that doesn't need to be a big cost. Much of the time, if the person's reasonable and you're happy with doing it, it builds a stronger relationship. Yeah. Okay, and we've all had to do that within family situations where something's not right, we're not comfortable. Thanksgiving, I should run promotions before Thanksgiving and Christmas because that's when all the funny fights happen, right? Where you've got to call people out for being silly or whatever when things get out of hand. I don't want that kind of behavior in my business or I don't want that kind of behavior in my house. And I'm not a bad person for wanting to succeed in business. If I don't succeed, I don't hire all the other people. One of the best methods, if you're an employee who wants to mess with your boss and make it hard for them to be assertive, is being passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. Those people suck. I've had some of them on my staff in the past. You know, as I started maturing more, I cleared them out. But those people suck because then you're tr- not that you need an explanation for people, but you're kind of saying, look, these are my standards. And they're like passive aggressive. They're like, yeah, I agree with that. I'm doing that. You know, it's just passive aggressive. They're stinkers, those passive aggressive people. And we all are to a sense, but they're stinkers. I had some tenants like that. And yeah, I totally, I hear you. It's really draining. It's very draining. Because they are there, or be really nice up front. Throw a little giggle in after they they jab at you, um, and you know there's something bubbling under the surface, and then you're sort of forced to do the work for them, or just deal with the unhated remarks. So there's no real. I don't deal with that anymore, though. I just yeah, just hey, look, there's something going on. Let's talk about it. Well, it affect your team. 
Everyone's been in a team like this, whether it's in sport or business, where you've got gossip or the innuendo or the backstabbing or the passive aggression. It will infect the rest of your team because you're feeling that way and everyone else is too. Yeah. So you've got to nip that in the bud. And the person's probably worth saving. They just need some help expressing themselves, right? They've learned this bit. Here's the thing I've learned about assertiveness. Nobody teaches it to you. We get taught to say please and thank you. We yeah. get taught to have good manners, but nobody teaches you how to stand up to your mother-in-law when she's overstepping her mark. Well, I've come up with training that handles sort of 85% of the really hard stuff, yeah. not the easy stuff with the, with being more so sort of like accepting compliments and, and sharing opinions, but making requests for your own desire or saying no to things that you don't want to do. These are the two really big things that, that passive people that they fall into. And I found it to be mostly a game of status, right? And it really gets in the status is like the same side of it as aggression. We have a need for it. And you're not a bad person for wanting to drive a cool car or having fancy clothes or whatever it is. You might have a different level. You got into pharmacy because of the status, at least a smart profession. Mm -hmm. People are going to look at you and go, that person's, what are you, a pharmacist? Oh. There's a little bit of a, a little word. There's a little bit of stick that you're a, you're a clever duck. So the status side of things is there in all tribes. And assertiveness are the rules of the game in order to gain people on your side, to maintain standards of good communication and clear communication. And the tribe will also sort of climb the ladder of status. About two or three years ago, business got rough and I lost just a ton of staff. I wasn't around as much. And one of the more visible leaders of the team, I mean, I was a leader, but one of the more visible leaders took off. And then it seems like people took off after that. They've kind of lost their tribe that they've had. And here's the problem I see is employees can come in and they'll say, I'm putting my two week notice in. And it seems like everybody accepts that. And even a boss might say, just to calm the waters, might say, well, congratulations on your deciding this for your life and this and that. But as bosses, it's really nobody's damn business why I'm letting somebody go. And I might decide, you know, if someone's an employee of mine, I might decide that, you know, they're 49% good, but. 51% bad. I just feel like doing this. It's just a little itch I have. You know, I'm going to change things up. But you can kind of become the devil for that. Oh, for sure. You can always justify it with a bunch of reasons. I think, I can't remember who said it, but there's nothing worse than an, an average staff member hmm. because you can't fire. They're hard, to, they're hard to fire. Yeah. And then throw in their passive aggressiveness too that they're not admitting to. <laughs> they're infecting the rest of the team with the mediocrity. And so you'd rather have a bad employee than, a, than an average one. Because you can say, well, you can point to a problem, but those hangers on, the ones that just stick around, right? Look, I'm on your side with this one, man. If you've got to get rid of someone because you think they're a cancer on the sort of performance of your team, it's not about them. It's, it's not about them. It's your business. This is the funny thing about pharmacy. Yeah. You go into any other business. If you went to a painting company or construction company, they're there to make money. That's what businesses are for. And they make money because they add a lot of value to their clients or their patients as a case may be. You're not a government organization there to make people happy that work for you. That is a really good way to keep them there. It's in your interest to, to make them happy. But if they're not going to jive with your culture or your standards or your team or your goals, I don't know what other option you have if you want to stay in business for a while. You're going to weigh yourself out. You're going to go nuts. Tyson, I think that you're really onto something there because let's say you're selling paint, you know, and God bless everybody who sells paint. And that could be a good mission for somebody's life. But you don't usually look around a bunch of these Sherwin Williams places and say, you know, we don't care so much about money. We're here to bring beauty to people's lives. And this is what's important to us. And we'll do this even if we don't make money. You don't hear that. But pharmacy is so used to not making a profit and being pushed around that sometimes we owners almost feel like we're running like a charity case. We take that word profit out of there. And when that's gone, it's hard when the real reason you're there is not there. I get that feeling for pharmacists a lot because 
To be a pharmacist, you need to be compliant with the rules. Yeah. Or people die. And so there's a real caring factor. The caring is extended to the patients. Yeah, you need to care for your staff too, to a certain degree, but there's an expense if you care, if they care more about their whatever is yeah. money. Um, if, if you care more about that than you do about the longevity of your business, then you're not going to be able to serve the patient anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I focus on pharmacy is because there's a logical part of your brain. There's a, a, a communal part of your brain. And when you focus on that a lot, right, that's the passive side. When you focus on that a lot, your desire gets buried underneath all the rules of the tribe and right. you're out of touch with it. And so what I found with working with people with assertiveness, we start at the beginning. You can only take the step that's in front of you. And passive people are very rarely aware of what they want. Actually, aggressive people, they say what they want and then they get it and they didn't want that anyway. So, so you never know. But passive people are painfully aware of what they don't want because it happens several times a day and they walk away and they go, oh, I should have said that or I wish I'd have done this or I really got to do this or I'm going to stand up to this person or I'm settling for this standard that I shouldn't. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The list goes on. They're really aware of it. Want to say something, but they don't have the tools. And so the path that we take to getting to what it is that you want is starting with articulating what you don't want, not just knowing what you don't want because you already do that. It's painful to you, and that's the first step. That's the step that's in front of you is knowing what you don't want and being able to talk about it. I guess some really clever bloke could come along and write a speech operated application to to practice those situations. That's what um, we're talking about. Right. Yeah. So they can't talk about it. They don't have the tools and the tools are very simple, but I'm, I looked into the field of assertiveness with the psychologist. Most of it's books. Okay. Most of it is books. And it, even the best selling books say on my page two, this book isn't going to help you because you don't gain skills. You don't gain social skills by reading books. Yeah. That's the problem. You need to practice it. And so the way that I approach it is, okay, look, we're heading in this direction. I want to start at the beginning. You know what you don't want. Let's work on the tools to articulate that. What you don't want is usually a standard not being met in the physical world that we can both agree on, right? So the method is you're using a blue pen for these documents. Mm -hmm. Now I can see the blue pen and Mike, you can see the blue pen. And so there's no status anymore. It's mm. I'm the boss and you need to do what I mm -hmm. It's this is a blue pen. What I want to see is you're using a black pen because we need to use those the legal documents. Request. Will you do that? It's very simple. So it's a it's it's an external reality that we can both agree on to reduce status. So it's not a status, it's not a, I'm the boss of you. When you're old daughter, you have to learn these. For any kids, they're defined. We kind of want them to be defined because we want them to be strong and to be able to deal with the yeah the big bad real world. And so to get them to do what you need them to do, you remove status and look at an objective reality that that try very hard to disagree with it. So over a hundred role plays that we train on sort of anxiety provoking situations, but security of your own forward. So you're practicing talking to your phone, which you do sometimes anyway. We use our phone for a lot of other things these days, but sometimes we talk and so you, you're looking at a role play and you Recognize the situation. You get taught the methodology that psychologists use. You know, some can go right into their own method. So right off, we, we talk about practicing the method and knowing what the method is, why. And then we start to ease you into some role plays where you have to speak the answers so that you're getting comfortable with the methodology. I don't want you to read about it. You're not going to change your life. I don't want you to be impressed with my app. Yeah. I don't want you to tell me that I'm clever or that I've fixed this issue. I want to hear you tell me, oh man, I stood up to my boss. I, went, I was able to handle this stuff. Ever. That's what I want. I want to see the real results in your life. That's what gives me the warm fuzzies. Okay. So we practice the first one, which is we agree on an external reality. Hey, right now, you know, the clothes are on the floor in the room. What I want to see is I want the clothes in the basket or put away the dresser. Will you do that? That's the request. Okay. So you can do that with your style. Um, and it's easy for me to tell you that, but doing it is very anxiety provoking for a lot of people in, in whatever the situation is. The second one is when somebody makes a request of you, 
or you're dealing with the internal reality of somebody else. Okay. Somebody asks you, Hey, can you give me a, can you give me a lift on Saturday? That's a request. I can't point to that. So there's no way to like look at the ex external reality of like, so you say, well, this is a psychologist, salespeople, they all do the same step so that we know we're on the same page. We're on a level ground and we say, I understand you want me to give you a ride on set. Then you sort of follow the same process. You say like what your conflict and desires are, right? So I'm saying my desire, but how it conflicts with yours or just say what I want right? or what I don't want. I want to stay at home with my family that day and then make a request or redirect the conversation that maybe, right? Maybe you could ask your cousin and always go to car. Or I understand you need a ride this Saturday. Giving you three rides this week, man. I, I want to stay home. So we or really organize something else. Then, you know, like this, I'm not, I'm not being a jerk. This is people's advice for passive people. No is a complete sentence. That's true, but it's crass and abrasive and, and it's not going to come out nicely. It's not going to do anything for that relationship. And passive people aren't going to say that. Aggressive people say, dog. No. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So I'm trying to provide the tools for the people who need it in a way that's conducive for them doing it. Yeah. What I'm finding is passive people are a lot more angry than they give themselves credit. Oh, of course they are. Passive people are really angry. Yeah. And they're afraid of their own anger. I think of it like I grew up in the tropics, so we do a lot of swimming. Yeah. But we you know when it put, you're in a pool and you push the ball down yeah. underneath the water and then you let it go, you don't know where it's going to go. It could go right. left, right, forward, back. Right. It could hit you in the nose. So I see it like that. Like you've got the surface of the water and that's the rules of the tribe, the social you know, standards. And you, what you want is the ball and the ball wants to come up. And so if you practice holding this ball underneath and you're afraid of where it's going to go, maybe you should be. Maybe if you let it out and say, no, you're going to bark at someone or say something mean. Right. But if you have sort of structures to let the ball out slowly, you can actually use that to to build relationships. And I found that to be really good. Like really, it enriches all the relationships in your life mm -hmm. because you're giving more of yourself and you're not sacrificing or damaging the relationship. You're just saying what it is that you want or who you are, what your goals or your desires. And the person actually, they want to know more about you. Yeah. And then you're as a leader, right? Because it's not easy to do. Not many people are assertive in a constructive way. They see that in you. This is where it's good for fantasy. They see that self-expression in you and you're inviting them to do the same in a constructive sort of milieu or really way that is conducive to team building and sharing information and letting me know more about you. And then when those situations do arise of, hey, I want to go elsewhere, it's, or you'll probably get it, you probably avoid that a lot because there's this issue that they don't want to bring up. And if I just cut this job out of my life, I don't have that problem anymore. But if you're the kind of leader that welcomes communication, constructive way, it's going to be helpful to those people to express themselves so we can avoid that situation to begin with. To them leaving. Yeah. You know, people don't leave. Well, they're saying now because of benefits, but it's, it's, it's the financial situation is different than it has been. But people stay, people stay with you for their strengths and they leave for their weaknesses, right? They want to have that growth. You want to pay them for their strengths. You don't want to pay them for their weaknesses. You, know, you want to pay them for their strengths. You want to develop their weaknesses. And it can be, as a leader, I think we all kind of want to do that, especially pharmacists. We want to see people grow and help them have a relationship and lead a team. And so, but you're not going to be able to do that if they could see you as a confident person who can handle all kinds of situations and all kinds of information that, that they're going to share with you. And they're, just think about like the top 10 relationships in your life. And what if you gave 15% more of yourself to those and those people gave 15%? You've got a richer life. Every one of your relationships is enriched through being able to communicate what you want to say, who you are, your desires in an appropriate way, not oversharing, but in an appropriate, balanced way. And there's a lot more for you to give and receive. As I said earlier, I was kind of fashioned more in the role of usually trying not to rock the boat, but I found in my life, and I've worked on this even with some outside help on this, but 
when you've got that ball underneath the water, let's say, when that ball finally has to come up and you know it's going to come up because you don't have a choice because the issue is on the table or it has to be on the table, I found myself, and I think other people tend to do this unless I'm the only crazy one out there, but I found myself being aggressive because you don't know where the assertiveness is going to go. I found myself being aggressive because then the person receiving it, they'll say, well, boy, Mike meant it because he was angry or he slammed his fist down or he's really sure of his stuff. And so I guess I'm going to do that. The problem with that, that's not long term because how many times is your employee or family member going to put up with you pounding your fist and really making a statement? There's no growth from that. You might get your way temporarily, but it's not long term. No, it's not conducive to a good relationship because you're not considerate of the rules of the relationship. Or what you're going to do, the unwritten rules, right? Mm -hmm. What you're going to do is invite them to do the same. That's interesting. Yeah. So they're going to they're gonna mirror the leader's behavior by yelling back at you. Mm -hmm. And you, you, there's a part of you, there's a part where you kind of want that. But if you aren't demonstrating the kind of behavior that you want to see, you're not going to get it as a leader, right? Yeah. You're setting the tone in every situation, whether it's your family or your business. You're setting the tone for the standards of communication. It's going to come out somewhere. You don't know where you've got a problem at work. And where's the safe place? The safe place is home. And then you're going to take it home and you're going to kick the dog and you're going to yell at the wife or the husband of the case may be or the kid. And we all, we're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of that. I wrote an article recently about assertiveness in your marriage. It's, it goes for all relationships, right? If there's a problem in a relationship and it's minor and you, let's say the relationship lasts for 20 years, but you don't speak up. It's like a, a fire hose, you know, the ones that flatten out. It's got a little bump at the start. The bump, as every rotation of every year goes by, For the sure. problem gets bigger. And after 20 years in a marriage, let's say, of that same problem, it might not be worth unraveling because there's so many problems. So handling problems as they arise and having the tools to do it comfortably where it's actually going to enrich your relationships. I know that's a lot to wrap your head around because we're so avoidant of confrontation. I drink my own Kool-Aid. I've been doing... The course myself. I thought I was a pretty assertive guy. I told my wife, she's like, you're not doing that assertive training. You don't beat that. But just being able to have that strength scaffolding that to the training wheels, right? The, the, to walk into a situation where it, it's hairy, right? We've all got hairy situations. For me, it's like, I've got kids. I've got two families to join together, right? My wife's family and my family. And you got grandma and grandpa and they're they're trying to be involved and their values are going to be different to yours. And is, there's going to be toes stepped on. I mean, to be able to handle that without stress in the relationship by actually using it as an opportunity to build a relationship. It's, I can't think of a better word in enriching the relationships in my life to be able to do that confidently and by expressing myself, but there's no danger. The danger is made up because I didn't have the tools. You can really get in trouble if you keep sweeping stuff under the rug. Yeah, and you don't know how small it's going to be. It could be really minor. And I think that's something that responsible people do. They blame themselves. You cannot control anything else. You can only control yourself. So you're going to naturally blame yourself if you're a responsible person. I do. You've got a line, though. There's a line. Maybe you're mad. This is why I say it's a status game. Yeah. So you're walking away from that situation. I should have said this. And then in your head, it was like, I would have said this and then they would have reacted, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Or, oh my God, you're so much cooler than me, much better than me. Yeah. That's what you want because you feel like they denigrated you in fashion. It is a sort of internal, this is status, right? Status, yeah. your level of totem pole in the tribe. Yeah. It's never like that. And you don't want it to be like that, right? Especially if you're a passive person. You want to be on even keel and you want to, you want to have a relationship with these people and you absolutely can. And if, Here's one of the things that I found. People think that they're cowardly for not handling it. Well, or they're, they are, they are afraid and you should be, right? Because that's appropriate. Maybe that's served you in the past. Get too aggressive to wait for a safe sort of outlet. But calling yourself cowardly, which passive people are 
tend they tend to do they really get hard on themselves it's like i related to hey look i've got 300 dollars worth of groceries to buy and i've only got 200 dollars and feeling anxious about that you don't have the tools to buy 300 dollars worth of groceries so good and so similarly you just don't have the tools to handle the situation you can learn them and incorporate them into every facet of your life in just a few weeks and so we've de designed the training to be sort of just five minutes a day we practice six or seven role plays a day or three times a week, better, more the better. And then they gradually get more difficult, but they're, but they're, it's an anxiety provoking situation on the safety and the security of your phone, right? Nobody's going to yell at you. And there's a really secure structural procedure to do this. And more importantly than just reading it, right? I'd like to decide, I like to sort of describe this as if Kobe Bryant, the, the work ethic guy, right? To be in the gym and putting up 800 makes. Well, that's why that's the way I've decided. If you really want to change your life, you really want to lead your team better, have better relationships, and assert yourself and communicate better. This is a way that is you know, one of the chances that practicing hundreds of repetitions of the best psychological methods a month are not going to yield you a result. That's where I'm going. So Kobe's getting to the gym, putting up 800 makes. You're in the gym, putting up 800 reps of just little short bursts right on your phone. This is how I do it. Then you get into the situation and you've done it 800 times. It's just more. It's a big deal. There's no anxiety. I got the structure. I got the reps. I know what I'm doing. We're good. And that's the essence of leadership where you've developed a framework, a foundation where people can rely on this level of communication. When you talk about status and so on, some of the listeners are in this position where let's say they bought a business and let's say they bought a pharmacy and in pharmacy, quite often there's a senior partner and a junior partner where the sale doesn't happen in one day. It might happen over three years or 10 years if it's family, something like that. And I think a lot of what happens is sometimes, even though the new younger person is the boss, people kind of still look to the old lady or the old man as the boss. And even though you're paying the people and so on. Yeah. And I think sometimes the younger person is looked at like the, uh, you know, like Prince Harry is now or something. <laughs> kind of looked at as not being as powerful. Sometimes as a boss, I've almost forgotten that I'm paying the people. Sometimes I try to get so on their level where you're trying to encourage people. Sometimes I've done so much of that. What I feel like doing one of these months is... Getting all the paychecks in dollars, like getting $20 bills, and instead of just a keystroke, the person comes over to you and you go 20, 40. You're throwing 20s down, 60, yeah. 80, 100, 120. You're throwing them down like that. And then you say to them, hey, change that ink color. You know what I mean? It's like, sometimes you forget that you're paying them. So there is a, there is power difference in a business. Absolutely. And what I'm talking about is there's status in everything. There's a really good book about gaining status by or in plan called Pitch Anything. It's terrible for passive people because you try and follow these rules and you end up being really aggressive. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> but no, it is. When you think about it in terms of primates, the alpha or the biggest the biggest guy in the room, he gets his first pick of mating or the fruit. Yeah. They get groomed. They get the first grooming. People are picking them away yeah. out of their hair and eat them and that sort of stuff. That's not dependent on intelligence or capacity. It's just you have the pole position. I'm not saying that's bad. I think that that is the game. Right? We're all playing that game on status. And there's three kinds of status. There's There's virtue. There's success, and then there's domination. Probably the most fun way to learn about it is to watch Game of Thrones. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, mate, it's a lot of fun. It's it's all status games. It's all it's just all that for eight years. It's fun. But the rules of playing it in like today, we're about success, right? We're trying to make money in pharmacy in an ethical way. So we have success and virtue. There's a little bit of domination, right? There's a little bit of, I'm the big dog. This is my yep. business. You've got to do that. But if I told pharmacists to do that, Hey man, put all your money out in twenties and hand it over and then boss them around. I'm not going to be very successful because it's just not, I know you feel that way. It's, and it's very natural to feel that way, but that can come out in a more constructive way where they understand where you're coming from. Where you're like, there's probably some resentfulness with that staff member if that's how you feel. 
And you can say, hey, Johnny, I understand you've got a complaint. I want to hear about it. Or I understand that you don't agree with this process. Or what I'm seeing here is that you haven't done the training. What I want to see is you do in the training. Will you do it? What can I do to help you? Is it like 15 second conversations that can relate so much of your anxiety when leading a team or when dealing with family members or whatever that nobody teaches us? They really don't. And when they do, it's like, just say this. It's like a real masculine conversation. You've got a problem. Here's the solution. Just do it. Well, I don't learn that from a PowerPoint. I have to do things thousands of times before I incorporate it as my personnel. You see it as aggression because you're passive and anybody who says anything, that's going to sound aggressive. It's scary, right? To a passive person, I'm naturally passive. I'm a good little boy. It's scary to me to do that. I want that, right? Because there's this, there's this part of me that wants things that are pushing below the surface. But it doesn't need to come out like guns blazing. It can come out and build relationships with your business and invite those situations to be like, to be more productive instead of creating submission or domination. And like, no, that's a bad thing. Sometimes domination is required. Sometimes. I just don't think it's very natural. To, like if you were in the sales industry, door to door sales, very success in domination. Right. But pharmacy, I think, is more about virtue, success, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of domination in that of status of the games of status. But assertiveness will help in every, in every one of those. These are the rules. These are the rules and the tools to play that game, to play it successfully and to build relationships and move together as a team and invite others to be, to communicate the same. I had this guy like 10 years ago. He was a delivery guy for us. And Again, I was kind of stuck in this passive or the aggressive. I didn't mean I was passive aggressive, but I was either on this agreeable side or right. the aggressive side. And he had this like Detroit Tiger shirt on and I wanted him to wear something a little bit snazzier for deliveries, not come up with this Tigers or rock and roll shirt or something on. And Again, I was so caught in those two sides that I said something like, hey, what do you think about this? I didn't give a damn what he <laughs> thought. I knew what I wanted. And then when he started saying, well, Mike, I'm not going to wear that because you said, what do I think? And then I lost it on him. I became aggressive because right. I was like, how dare you tell me what you think when I was the one that asked him. So that training is so good because there's rules. There's, hey, these are my needs. How can we do this? It's being truthful again. Yeah. So the way that you handle that situation, you'd be like, hey, man, you're wearing this Tigers, this shirt. I get it. That's cool. It's not a big deal. What I want to see is something that's more conducive to my business. What can we do about getting you to wear something more appropriate? Or will you wear something more for you so that one of my customers, blah, blah, blah. And he might say no to that. Like being assertive, being assertive doesn't mean you always get what you want. It means that you say it in a way that's more conducive that people will listen or you're more likely to get what you want. Or at least it doesn't damage those relationships where you're flying off the handle at them. It's just like a little bit of structure, a little bit of scaffolding. I used it yesterday. We had a basketball game. Grandma and grandpa didn't have seats. There was a seat in the middle. Hey guys, the seats vacant grandma and grandpa here do you mind if i take it yeah go ahead protect yourself so many times throughout the day and you incorporate it into your personality so quickly if you practice if you do the work right that doesn't it's not magic if you like it i'm not interested if you like me i don't want to show you a book or powerpoint presentation because no that's not how you learn new skills but he learns skills that way you need to practice and practice like repetition so that it is unconscious for you and it, that's when it's going to be a part of your identity and who you are. One of the things I've noticed with this training is I make you divide between the external and the internal reality. We're either dealing with the clothes on the floor, which we could both agree with, or we're dealing with something that you feel so that I can start on the same level as you without sort of making a top down thing and I'm forcing you to do something and I'm comfortable doing that too. What happens when you know damn well you don't want the guy in a tiger uniform anymore you've got to articulate your standards now yeah. right that's what we're talking about the reason that you articulate the state isn't so that they get a chance to to defend themselves or anything it's yeah. so that you reduce the top down and there's nothing wrong with top down it's just i can't get some people to do that without it's just a an opportunity to start on level ground so that i, I can get you to agree because 
you're an agreeable person if you're passive. And if I can start with agreement, then I'm more likely to do it and be comfortable in saying what it is that I want. Because I don't know what I want, I push it under the pool, right? I can say what I don't want and I can say yeah. what I don't like. And I know that because that shirt really pisses me off right now. The shirt you're wearing is so going with our outfit, man. You have to be truthful, but you can still find softness around where that standard is. Yeah, I'm more being soft about it so that the, a passive person will say it. Yeah, because they might not say anything. Somebody who's already doing this, like, I kind of think I'm more in the middle. I might say, Tyson, come on, let's get to the meat a little bit more. But some people wouldn't even, like, breathe this. And so you got to get them in steps. And that's where your program's so cool. Yeah, I'm lowering the anxiety. I'm lowering the obstacles to get into the conversation. To say it at all. Agreeable people want agreement, okay? And then they're more likely to say what they want. Yeah, right. It's just to get people to do this. Otherwise, what happens after you become more assertive, you can just go, hey, man, we found have that in here. And you're cool with it whether he doesn't like you or not, right? It doesn't matter. But when you're starting from being a passive person, and a really compliant person, you don't upset anyone's feelings and you're scared to assert your standards and your boundaries and your goals and your feelings because you're it, because it's all sort of bowled up underneath the water. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. So I want you to do it because what I found is when you articulate what you don't want, it's, it's very much like people who journal. They have like a miasma of thought and, and journaling gets you to write it out in a linear, it makes that cloud into a line so that do you understand the person you're articulating it? Understand it as well. Being able to say what you don't want in a way that you're more likely to say it helps you to be more in touch with what you do want. You're sort of chipping away at, oh, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh, maybe I do like this. Because passive people are very aware of what they don't want. What they do want is probably the opposite. This isn't like Tyson's program on how everybody should be assertive. You're not taking someone who's aggressive and how to bring them back to assertive. You're not taking someone who's already assertive and wants to get better. You're really taking somebody who's passive and you're saying, come on, let's do this step by step. Yeah. Aggressive people don't sign up for assertive training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my market. No, they don't, they don't know, they don't care, they don't need to care. They don't have these like, same kind of relationships that you or I do. But me personally, I really like aggressive people. You right? do? I do. I really like them. I like the Filipino culture. My wife, you would describe as aggressive. My best friend in Australia, I don't want to uh, throw him under the bus too bad. But yeah, he's, he can be aggressive, but they do it in a different way, right? So they're coming back to the middle, but they usually do it like emotionally. They sort of soften the blow of their crassness with feelings. Last week, this daughter, the adult daughter, 60-some, and her mom's 80 or 90, she called me and wanted something, and supposedly she told me not to deliver this to her. Supposedly she told me that she wanted to come pick it up in the pharmacy. We delivered it to her, and I think this lady's brother chewed her out. That's my imagination. So she called the pharmacy to be assertive. And she told my staff, I told Mike to do this. We don't want our mother to be in the medicine, this. And then I told Mike this. So she hangs up and this is an assertive person. She probably did it with the right tone to my employee. My employee tells me this. I said, she's a bitch. And then I said, she's another word. And I said, it rhymes with this. I said, she's both of those. And I'll <laughs> never forget it. I thought she was a sweetheart. I'm never going to forget it until she dies. She was not aggressive. She was assertive. I called her two names at least. I've got some other ones in my head. I know that's a psychological problem on my part. I shouldn't go after her like that and call her those names for doing that. Sometimes that's maybe how I think people would feel about me if I did that approach. And I know it's about the tribe, but that's how I felt. Well, that's how you felt. And that would be a good reason to bury your wants and needs underneath the structure of the rules. Because if you if you were to spit back at her and she was like, but I just told you what it is that I want. Yeah, I'm, no, I didn't do anything. I just felt that way. Right. That's why you, you felt that way. And we all do. 
right? We all do when people sort of point things out to us of our shortcomings, Yeah. right? If I would have talked to her, I would have probably felt a little bit better because I would have talked to her and heard her voice. I think it was that relay of stuff that really made me call her a bitch. Well, this is, well of course, you're like this assertiveness stuff is really just a structure to, to relay information. And you've got a, like a grapevine and the information was lost to emotions or you know, resentment or aggression. And it all ended up being the same anyway. So you felt offended or... Because in my mind, her tone of voice, which I didn't hear at all, yeah. in my mind, she was talking to me like some teacher from my childhood. I was putting it the worst I could because I didn't actually talk to her. Well, also, you messed up. And so you felt bad already. I don't think I messed up. I think <laughs> she was wrong. No, seriously, Tyson. I would have done something with that. I don't think I was wrong. And we went out of our way. We called the doctor on this and did that. And well, I didn't do all of it, but at least I told someone to do it. But in theory, it was work. And I don't think I goofed up. I would have said, hey, I think I told you this. I'm not sure I did. But look, mom's at home and this and then. It might have been it might, it might have been me. I don't know. But can we do this? But I just heard it as her just being a bitch. Well, you, your sense of status was offended. I think it was. Yeah, you were you were offended because you were a proficient and professional person that was offended, yes. and so she was taking you down a peg, and so your aggression was sort of activated. It was activated like a gorilla, and again, I wouldn't have said anything to her. I would have done this. It settled down now, but in the moment, you don't have time for the frontal cortex to catch up. It's just the lizard in there. You're just pissed off. That's what it's all about: provides some structure for the lizard. And it sounds like you, you did a good job with that. The staff could have used the, hey, you know, we messed up here. I think they did. It just came to me. It's like, hey, who was that? Oh, that was Patty. She was saying this or that. And then I let all the expletives fly, at least in my head. No, it wasn't in my head. I did ask them what rhymed with a certain thing because I was going to say what else I called her. They heard all of it, but they knew I was just blowing smoke, just they blowing smoke. Just having fun with it. It's probably not a bad thing for you to be able to communicate that with your team. Yeah. So I'm following it with, with the team and letting them express themselves or demonstrating it. Tyson, cool having you on again. That's the stuff that's hard to train. So if you can train stuff like that, the stuff that gives you butterflies, you're going to come out ahead. Well, thank you very much, sir. One of the things I like to think this business is, the first time I saw Robin Williams, somebody, I heard somebody say, if only you could bottle that. And I was like, what does that mean? I was young. What does that mean? Well, if you bottle it, then sell it. Okay. So I try to bottle intelligences from leaders and not just put it into a book, but put it into a way that you will reliably get a return on the investment and yes. you will take in the intelligence yourselves. So I'm very excited to work with pharmacists. I think you guys are the key to covering chronic disease. And I'm very happy to be able to help you guys express yourselves and hold your team accountable and have richer relationships in your lives. All right, Tyson, until next time, thanks. Talk to you soon. Thanks, bye.